Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Uh, I have a special guest with me. I have Gregory, who runs the famous YouTube channel DAP University and makes awesome tutorials on how to get started with Ethereum and how to uh, make different types of DAPs and other things in the ecosystem. So, hi Gregory, great to have you. Great to chat with you today. Hey, how how is everybody doing? I, I'm doing well. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, uh, Gregory. So, like, let's talk about our backgrounds first, um, and I let you begin. So, what's your background, and how did you get get into the Ethereum space? Sure. So, um, yeah, my background. You know, I'm a programmer. I've been uh, building applications for a long time, uh, mostly web applications, and um, you know, I like a lot of people, kind of. Uh, became aware of blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, by price action and kind of seeing uh, people invest and getting returns. And um, and that caught my attention. Um, But, you know, being in technology and uh, I was very curious about, you know, what lied beneath that. And, um, you know, learning about Bitcoin, learning about blockchain, learning about uh, Ethereum, uh, I wanted to get my hands dirty on some code. And at the time, you know, Ethereum was uh, kind of the best place for me to get started. Um, had a, already uh, had a lot of uh, momentum with developer tools and um, ways that you could kind of dive in and build something yourself. So that, that was a natural fit for me. And uh, how did I get started doing what I'm doing? I, when I learned, you know, it was, there were some good resources out there, a lot of blog posts, a lot of, uh, uh, some, some good courses out there, some good video courses. Um, but you know, I, I saw a need for good video content. I saw a need for, you know, uh, some real hands-on step-by-step, uh, walkthroughs. And it's something I wish I had more of when I was getting started. And, uh, yeah, I figured I would give the people what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. And as for me, like, again, I, I have a computer science background. I, I, I used to develop a lot of apps. Uh, I'm an Android developer and, uh, I got into the Bitcoin space around two, three back, uh, two, three years back, bought some Bitcoins. But, uh, when I saw Ethereum, um, around a year back now, so that is what like, uh, got me started. And uh, I started to make like videos, um, basic videos on what is blockchain, what is Ethereum. But uh, late, like after that, I moved on to like making core videos, like uh, what what is happening in the core aspects and in the research act- aspect of things, like what are various projects like Zero X, uh, other blockchains like Zilliqa or Kyber, what these projects are doing, and interviewing CEOs in the space. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, let's talk about some uh, projects. Um, like, w- what what projects are you interested in the space and some DApps and all that? Right. So there's so much you know happening right now. Um, you know, everybody is in uh, a rush to get something out there and to uh, prove that they can build something on blockchain. And that's what's really exciting about this space, right? And uh, that, you know, has its pros and cons, right? They're, we're going to see some mistakes happen and uh, some people are going to lose a little bit of money, both users and, uh, you know, companies. Um, but that's just kind of the nature of, of the ball game. You know, you can go to a website like dapradar.com and uh, I, I remember when dapradar first launched and now if you go there, I mean, there's just pages and pages and pages and pages of, of dapps that you can browse and uh, you can sort them by uh, their metrics and everything. And uh, I first want to just kind of turn people onto that resource if they're curious about like what dapps are out there. Like, like there's some that we're going to cover today, but if you want to just kind of go deep down the rabbit hole, like mm-hmm. go there and you just kind of click around and, and, and explore. Um, but for me, you know, a lot of projects uh, come to mind. I mean, we're, I guess we can kind of go by categories, right? Like we're seeing a lot of uh, solutions for, or some solutions for like decentralized social networks. We're seeing mm-hmm. some solutions for, um, you know, decentralized uh, exchanging, right? That's a big use case that people are trying to, to solve or just decentralized financial transactions mm-hmm. of some kind. Um, 
more like uh, decentralized autonomous organization projects, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, where you basically build an entity that runs itself on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the crypto collectibles, the crypto games, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I know those are more categories and specific dApps, but uh, mm -hmm. do you see any other categories like that that, are, that I might have missed? Yeah, uh, I think obviously we have collectibles like uh, crypto kitties, um, crypto countries, so many other uh, collectibles out there. Um, and I think there are a lot of uh, projects that are like using uh, uh, Ethereum as a way for payment, like uh, having using the payment channels um, on Ethereum and using them to pay people, like say in industries in which there might be a lot of uh, a lot of bottleneck in having centralized people holding people's funds like uh, there's an example of a spank chain uh, sure. which, which is like a decentralized scam site right now um, and what they do is like they uh, when you are paying a performer you directly pay them in ethereum and the money go the value goes to their wallet whereas in a normal centralized application that money used to go to their paypal account or um, they that used to go to the campsite and they were able to like uh, hold their money they and they didn't have a lot of clarity of how they used to deal with their money like there might be sometimes uh, there are cases that uh, they won't give the money uh, in the piece per person's hand uh, till like two three months or like six months so that is uh, another use case like using payment channels um, is an interesting use case and I think still sure uh, like till now the currency aspect has been the most used of crypto and uh, like th that is what has like enabled us to that is what has got uh, so much hype uh, because it, people there are projects like hyperledger fabric and like core blockchain coda r3 but it's because there is this transactional utility to public blockchains and ethereum uh, that has uh, that is what people are in exploring and there is a lot of uh, opportunities to scale these applications to a lot of uh, people yeah yeah very cool yeah. yeah so the um yeah I mean, we can kind of like talk more about some of these use cases right uh mm -hmm. um i mean yeah so so yeah i think you hit the nail on the head where you know, stuff that has uh, financial transactions or financial incentives, right, uh, are definitely what I think is taking off right, and really sticking, right, mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, just because, I mean, Ethereum by nature is a pay-to-play network. And one area where I see this, you know, gaining traction for sure is in, with the game industry. Mm -hmm. um, with like uh, in-game currency and uh, things like that, right? Uh, where there actually is, you know, an alternate uh, economy, right? An alternate like reality of sorts where people are, are have, have always invested their time and have always invested uh, their resource, their financial resources into, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at that growing up time, uh, if anything, like uh, that's here to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, the the fact that someone can uh, spend their spend their time you know working on something in a game and achieve um, some level of success that translates into an in game currency that can then be cashed out into whatever their own like local currency is on uh, in their country or in their or whatever right like that translates into dollars or if you're you know bullish on crypto in the long run it translates into ether or bitcoin or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and like, um, because we have this programmable money feature, like you can do a lot of interesting stuff, um, with, with, the uh, with these things in applications like games, uh, that we weren't able to, I think, do before. Um, and even if say, uh, like they had points or something like that. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. Like having this in-game currency really um, is super helpful. And like, say, if you are an early adopter and you get to you you started using the game early, and your reward would be really high. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, that or you or you're able to secure some sort of assets in the game that then appreciate within that you know 
like economy, right? Uh-huh. You know, if you have a game, uh, uh, like one game is like crypto space commanders. Um, that's a conversation I have with another guy on my channel. Um, well, that's a cool game that's doing a lot of stuff on with, with blockchain and, and they've done really well. So for example, if you were to create an asset in that game uh, or any game like it and you were an early adopter of that game and you know, time passes and that becomes a coveted asset or you've made it better, mm-hmm. um, then you have something of value, right? That can be, uh, I guess, done with, with whatever you'd like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the decentralized exchange projects as well. Um, sure. So like for me, I have seen like Kyber, um, Zero X, uh, Bancor, and uh, I, I think uh, Zero X is super interesting in a way that it allows you to create your own uh, relayer um, and provide uh, like build your own decentralized exchange in a way. And it helps to provide liquidity to a lot of uh, assets, a lot of uh, crypto assets who might not be able to get registered on centralized exchanges and like say, if if you want to create if you have a speciality in real estate tokens like you know the real estate token game then you can build a decentralized exchange which has a speciality that it um only trades in real estate or it uh, it is it it ha- it only trades and it has researched the whole real estate market and lists around most of the real estate tokens so i think that is super interesting um and uh, kyber is another one which is super interesting um, because kyber has eliminated like the order book system um and it if if i i used to trade at kyber like i used kyber for trading and it mm-hmm. almost feels like trading at a centralized exchange um mm-hmm. yeah what are your thoughts on the space like the whole decentralized exchange space yeah, totally. So I think the ZRX project is awesome. Uh, how they've, you know, uh, you know, protocols, protocols and standards are the big, another hot topic right now. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, they've really done a good job at uh, codifying those kinds of things for decentralized exchanging. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we, we owe a lot or yeah, the space owes a lot to that project in particular, just for, um, kind of setting that standard and providing something that people can build up of. Um, I've got a, uh, another video coming out with um, another decentralized exchange. It's called uh, ERC Dex, um, yeah. Yeah. an American company. Um, so they're using the Xerox project. Um, another cool thing. Um, I guess we mentioned briefly, I guess we had talked before, uh, it was like the Bancor project mm-hmm. um, where, you know, it's, it's a different model. You're basically uh, trying to, you're exchanging tokens for uh, a set price, right? You're not having to do uh, limit orders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's another kind of uh, project that I've seen floating out there and people are using. It's uh, having pretty high transactions uh, per day. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, you mentioned radar. Did you mention radar relay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radar relay. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you have any more thoughts about that project? Yeah, radar relay has. I think it's one of the best uh, exchanges. Uh, ERC Dex is also super interesting. Um, and radar relay, um, DYD DX. These are interesting relays that have built on top of zero uh, X. Um, and yeah, I think they are doing a great job. Um, um, what's your opinion about like uh, decentralized exchange versus decentralized exchanges? Because currently we can't actually move to fiat with the decentralized exchanges. That problem has to be solved, isn't it? Right. Um, that's a good question. I mean, right now, I think that decentralized exchanges are serving a special customer, mm-hmm. a customer that wants to stay within the blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, for sure, and I think I think they're just going to have uh, they're going to serve a different customer, and they're going to serve a different use case, um, and that's just kind of the state of things for now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I I think I, so. Maybe to clarify that a little more, you know, there's two there's two two ways to approach this whole crypto game, right? Like you're buying in and you're cashing or you're cashing out, right? Or you're buying in and you're staying in mm-hmm. and you're staying in and you're staying in and you're staying in. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like the old, uh, uh, was it maybe a Warren Buffett quote of some kind? I'm, I'm sure I'm probably going to get it wrong, right? What's his favorite holding period? Life. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, I think there's a good amount of people who are, uh, you know, adopting that for crypto and uh, maybe not necessarily holding the same asset for life, but staying in the crypto space for, you know, indefinitely. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And like, say, if we get uh, adoption, more merchant adoption and all that, then that is going to further increase this uh, movement of staying in crypto. Um, what, yeah. Good. Sorry. Yeah. What's your opinion about, about uh, stable coins like uh, MakerDAO? Um, the die token basis. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a very strong opinions um, at the moment. Um, I've seen a lot of these projects kind of pop up. Uh, yeah, definitely MakerDAO um, on the radar. Uh, do you have any particular opinions on the matter? Yeah, uh, I think uh, MakerDAO is a super interesting project. Um, then we have Basis um, as well. Uh, we have Tether and True USD. These are three, four projects. But I think MakerDAO is the is the most transparent of all of them because uh, they are built on top of Ethereum. So uh, right, uh, that is like that provides a lot of transparency. Basis just raised around one thirty three million. Uh, that is why they got into the news. But I haven't seen anything. I I I I read a bit of their white paper, but it didn't excite me as much as MakerDAO does. Right. Um, yeah, and that's the thing. But I think stable coins are really important. Like, uh, like say if I am a merchant, um, then I I would accept stable coins other than uh, like say Ethereum. Uh, if right. Yeah. So stable coin problem is going to be uh, huge. Like even in say the games that we see um, that we are talking about earlier. Um, if, if, if stable coin concept can be introduced, I think that might overpower the token of the game. Um, if, if the trading is done only in stable coins, uh, then yeah, th- that, that might provide more utility. So I, I'm right. really excited about the space in general, but, uh, uh, there is there is a lot that needs to be done. And the trouble with MakerDAO that I can share is like uh, what people are criticizing is like, uh, say what happens is in MakerDAO is like, say if the price of Ethereum um, is going up, then there is no issue. Uh, it, it has two tokens. One is the DAO uh, Maker token. Another is the DAI. DAI token, D-A-I, is the stable mm-hmm. coin. It goes to, it, its value is close to one USD. Um but the trouble is when the price goes down, um, then there is an algorithm to uh, get more maker token in supply. And uh, there is an algorithm to adjust the price of the DAI token so that it should remain one US dollar. But if say the price goes from $700 to $10 within say two minutes or one minute, uh, then the, there might be some issues with the algorithm. So, uh, or say right. there is a bug in Ethereum and it just goes down to zero, then ov- or it goes down to say one dollar or something. Then I don't think so. It uh, th- there's some trouble with that system. So yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you want to talk about some other DApps? Uh, sure, sure, sure. I guess one category that we you know I mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, but I think I think people are very uh, excited to about the possibility of decentralized social networking, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, at, you know, I think we've all known. You know, anyone who's been involved in technology really has probably known for a long time mm-hmm. uh, what happens with data, right? When you when you give data to a big company, when you have a free platform, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're if it's free, then the customer is a product essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so. As a, there is a lot of room for somebody to really uh, lead the charge in in that area, and of course there, are, you know, Steam has been around for a little while, but uh, on Ethereum in particular, uh, the Peepith DApp is very cool. It's basically a decentralized Twitter. You know, we had Leroy before, mm-hmm. and uh, 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 Ben and Barton started Peepith, and uh, has been doing a really good job with that. They. Uh, it's a combination of Ethereum. They're also using IPFS uh, to kind of batch transactions together um, to, to minimize the amount of times essentially that you have to pay in order to write uh, data to the blockchain, which is pretty cool. Uh, the UX is also really good. Um, 
that's been a problem that people have been trying to tackle is like, you know, the block, you know, with Ethereum right now, you have the asynchronous nature of the blockchain uh, interacting with it, right? Interacting with smart contracts. Uh, you basically have to, uh, when, you're, when you're writing data, you have to, uh, uh, you know, essentially make an asynchronous call and wait for that to finish mm-hmm. in order for you to, to see success, right? Uh, to listen to events, things like that. Um, so, I mean, you have some of the same, you know, UX problems that you have to solve with other asynchronous apps that might be built on something like JavaScript, right? Um, but you have much longer wait times, right? Uh, if anyone's ever built, uh, you know, worked with an asynchronous API or just made asynchronous API calls in general, right? With like an Ajax or something like that on a client side app, mm-hmm. you know, you need to handle like asynchronous events and like uh, uh, moving on to the next thing and, and ha- using promises and things like that. But uh, you're talking like milliseconds, you know, if, if even, right? In machine time for those kinds of things. So, sometimes, sometimes they're longer running tasks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but with you know, the mainnet Ethereum blockchain, like transaction times be much, much higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, unbearable for most people. Like, like users have gotten used to just instant feedback with, with centralized web technology because we can scale our infrastructure to such a high power that you know, things just happen uh, almost instantly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's not quite where we're at with Ethereum right now. <laughs> so... You know, if you're going to write a transaction, you have to wait for a long time. That's a that's a big UX problem that we're trying to solve, and different people are handling that different ways. I think uh, I think I've seen a lot of people start to do that well. People, this is a good example. Yeah, um, well, you're talking about the data, but like uh, in people, the data is on on the blockchain. Like anyone can build their own front end. Uh, so, uh, like, say if it wanted to implement messaging. Um, then sure. it won't be possible because you won't, you don't want everyone to see the messaging on the blockchain. So I think privacy would be like uh, having all these uh, zero knowledge proofs or something like that here. Um, right, would be really useful. Like doing research there, like in which only say two people who are chatting or uh, who who are doing a transaction, they are only able to see uh, the data. But uh, or, or everything is stored on the blockchain, but only two people can see that. Um, I think, sure. that, yeah, that, that that needs to get solved uh, if um, we are thinking of building decentralized social networks. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to talk about some like other projects? Like, what's your what was your opinion about CryptoKitties um, and? Yeah, sure. Ahead. Yeah. CryptoKitties, you know, big project, probably the most famous collectible project, um, you know, uh, came out towards the end of last year, towards the end of 2017. Um, you know, kind of introduced this idea of a non-fungible token mm-hmm. um, and propose a new standard for Ethereum. So uh, if anybody's watching is is not familiar, uh, you know, we, we are we are in a, a rush to... Um, or a race, I should say, to set standards that everyone can agree on, right? Mm-hmm. Standards of how things should be done in Ethereum. And uh, a lot of people who are familiar with the cryptocurrency space are familiar with ERC-20 tokens, like as a category, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, these are basically tokens that are built on top of Ethereum. Um, and so that's a standard, right? ERC-20. And we've, we've moved on. And you can go on GitHub and look at the Ethereum Improvement Proposals Repository, mm-hmm. which then is translated to Ethereum Request for Comments, which is what ERC stands for. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it stands for. Um, and yeah, these things eventually get you know, community uh, feedback and they're vetted and eventually are adopted. And uh, that's kind of the process. And ERC-721 is still kind of in that process. We're, we're trying to figure out like, hey, if we want to represent assets on the blockchain, mm-hmm. uh, like, you know, non-fungible assets, assets that can't just be swapped out for something else, it's unique, right? If I have the Mona Lisa, right? I'm not exactly sure how much the Mona Lisa is worth, mm-hmm. but it, I know it's worth something and it's unique and I have to value it in some way and it can't be swapped out for another Mona Lisa, mm-hmm. right? Painting. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do with uh, ERC-721 and... CryptoKitties was um, kind of the first big like implementation of that, saying like, what can we do with digital assets in the blockchain, right? Like, cryptocurrency is there to be internet money, and this mm-hmm. is there to be an internet asset. 
so yeah yeah um yeah and i think like the way the crypto kitty project um it it clogged the network it uh, it showed everyone that we have a lot of limitations currently right. and and i think it really pushed uh, it it is like a thing which is pushing all the efforts for uh, sharding and casper um uh, and right right yeah any, any any scaling solution uh yeah we're definitely pushing our limits um and the fact that you know adapt can uh, get so popular right that it can uh do that i mean i think also like the fact that that was at the same time as uh the massive bubble that happened towards the end of last year. Uh, I, I, you're seeing all these tokens that are traded while CryptoKitties is doing this. It, it was a perfect storm of activity, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, but it, it's proof that, that we have work to do. We have uh, work to do and um, yeah, scaling is a necessity in order for this space to succeed and we're exploring all kinds of options from right sharding, uh, Plasma, Casper, um, side chain, state channels, um, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw you making a lot of videos about the uh, uh, POA network. Uh, right, right. Yeah. That? So another, uh, another big leap forward in the space is the POA bridge, uh, mm -hmm. which essentially is an interoperability protocol, which allows you to transfer uh, uh, tokens from one blockchain to another. So that, so here's the idea. Um, so POA network is an Ethereum sidechain. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, it's a fork of Ethereum that uh, works a little differently, right? So the main Ethereum uh, network is a blockchain that runs on uh, uh, a different consensus algorithm than POA network. So POA network has a proof of authority consensus algorithm where they basically have a, a, a vetted validators um, that basically have to have no criminal record, et cetera, et cetera, that act as the authority to validate transactions on the network. And so if you're going to be on the POA network, like you as a user can't just opt into the mining process, right? Like you can't just start up a node and say, I want to opt in to mine uh, a native currency on POA network. It doesn't work that way. You can do that on Ethereum, but you can't do it here. Um, so if you're on that network, right, and you have, um, you know, native, a native Ether essentially, like on that network, right? But it's a, it's a native POA currency. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if you want to get access to a liquidity market elsewhere, right? Like how are you gonna how are you gonna trade that for something else, right? Like uh, you'd have to have access to a liquidity market like on the network itself, right? So if you wanted to get access to a different liquidity market, uh, you would need a bridge. And that's what, you know, one big use case for this. Uh, so they have a, an ERC-20 implementation of their token on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the bridge allows you to do, allows you to move back and forth. So you can take your own uh, native uh, POA currency and uh, transfer it to the main Ethereum network to get POA-20 tokens, which is an ERC-20 implementation, ERC implementation of their currency and, and vice versa. So mm -hmm. you could simultaneously buy into the network by uh, purchasing POA-20 tokens on Ethereum and then moving over to POA network. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, what, what are some cool applications like that you see um, are going to use the PO network and uh, uh, yeah, what, what, what applications do you yeah, see? So, yeah, so uh, POA is definitely working on a lot of things to get out there. Uh, the stuff that's out there right now is they're doing their POA Explorer, which is pretty cool. Um, they got a lot of stuff that they're working on. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember... Uh, I'm trying to be careful of not to say anything that that's not public yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, they definitely have a lot of great things in their roadmap um, mm -hmm. that you can learn more about. You can subscribe to my channel or, or go look at their website and kind of follow along there. But yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, keep their roadmap uh, to myself for now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but the bridge project is, is very exciting. And because a lot of people have been trying to solve this problem. A lot of people have been trying to like, you know, make a bridge between two blockchains that works and uh, yeah, they did a good job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, like, and what, what you wanted to talk about the Scent platform as well on. Yeah. So since another example of decentralized, uh, you know, social media and, you know, they've done a good job at just providing uh, a way to, 
uh, incentivize people to participate in the network. And yeah, just throw it out there and their product to check out. Okay. Okay. Um, and one more project that I'd like to talk about is Aragon. Like uh, I, Aragon has been working on the de- the governance problem. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think... Yeah. Yeah. Tell me your thoughts on it. Yeah. I, I think it, uh, I had read the white paper, uh, not full, but I had a glance at it and I checked out their uh, website and the beta. The beta wasn't that great. I think it, I checked it around two, three weeks back. But uh, there, I think they they are moving along fine. Um, and right now they are um, basically helping other platforms. Like say Zero X has been rumored, um, and I watched one of the videos of uh, Will, uh, who's the CEO, talk about their uh, research with with Aragon. Um, and they are helping these DApps um, and other projects on ecosystem uh, on the Ethereum ecosystem to. Um, help them in their governance process. Like say if in zero X, they want to uh, upgrade their uh, smart contract, uh, main trading smart contract, then there should be a way to upgrade that. It shouldn't be that only people who are working at zero X company, um, they are able to participate. So sure. um, there should be a way that say all the community or all the token holders, um, they can take part in the upgradation and they can say that, okay, we are fine with, um, upgrading this part and uh, adding this feature or subtracting some other feature. Um, and they had some research in, um, I think liquid voting or something like that. Uh, what it, I don't know the exact term, but it's like, say if you are, uh, in zero X, they were talking about that, uh, the, their, what they say is that their use of the token is to, as a governance token. Um, so sure. they were talking like, say, uh, if you want to, we want our token holders, we wanted to build a protocol and we wanted a lot of people to take part in the governance and the upgradation process. So we created a token for that. And uh, they were talking that uh, like if if you want to say, if you have a lot of tokens, like say if you have 1 million um, or a lot of tokens, 0x tokens, you can give and then say you have entitlement of say 5 to 10% of the voting power, you can give that voting power to say a professor at uh, MIT or at Cornell who might be able to understand uh, what is happening better. So uh, that is what uh, they were working on. And I think Aragon is also uh, thinking about that. And um, they are trying to solve the like the DAO sort of aspect of things as well. So right. yeah, I think Aragon is super cool. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, they definitely are a productive project, you know, and that's, that's something that, uh, productive and prolific, right? Like, uh, that's something that a lot of people, uh, are, are wondering about, right? Like, so we had all these big ICOs happen, especially last year, you know, it was just like crazy going on and, uh, even into this year. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying, all right, where's the project? You know, who's going to deliver, who's going to, uh, uh, actually give us what they said they were going to. And yeah, I love watching projects where you can just you know, get on their uh, repositories or watch their Twitter and they're just moving and moving. moving, yeah, and, moving. Yeah. Um, and I think Erdogan's doing a really good job of that. Yeah. And what's your opinion about the ICO space as well? Like, uh, like sure. <laughs> do, you, do you see that it has slowed down or do you see that um, only say people who are really serious and uh, who have some working product, um, only they are going to be able to do the ICO? Uh, um, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a strong pulse on that at the moment. Um, I, one thing I do, uh, I think that more, I think we're seeing, and I could be totally wrong with this, so uh, uh, feel, feel free to correct me if you think otherwise, but I think uh, in a sense it's becoming even more decentralized uh, to, this, to the point of um, the – the knowledge of, of ICO as a means to raise capital, uh, that information is spreading and uh, people are becoming more and more aware of Ethereum. And I think we're seeing smaller companies do more modest size ICOs and things like that. And uh, I think we're getting closer to uh, cl- closer to tokenizing businesses um, in, in a more traditional case rather than just really speculative companies that may be born out of a place like Silicon Valley or something like that. Right. Or, uh, anywhere else. 
that has uh, large amounts of money that want to throw things at businesses and kind of see what sticks, you know, venture capital style investing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thought. Uh, like I said, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I don't have a strong pulse on, on that particular aspect of the equation. Mm-hmm. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I have. I was involved in the IC space uh, last year, so I've seen the mania. But I cut right. it. I cut out. Uh, I haven't been in the space for one or two months or two three months. Um, and but still, what I see is like uh, it has the space has matured super quickly. Like uh, it has been. Like if say, uh, usually things take two, three years to go through the cycle. Like say there's a lot of hype and a lot of bubble, bubble like behavior and finally Mm -hmm. like the Gartner hype cycle or something like that. But I think in the crypto game, everything is, uh, so compressed time wise. Yes. It's the nail on the head. Yeah. Everything moves way faster. Yeah. Because there's so much experiment, the rate of experimentation is super high. So um, I think that's the reason for that. And like, say in a normal startup game um, or say, like say in in India, I can give you an example, like uh, when the startups ecosystem was developing here, the, there was a lot of startups who were just raising money. Like uh, when the VC ecosystem was developing here, uh, there was a lot of bubble like behavior and it took around two, three, four years to uh, finally uh, get, due to the equation that people started to realize that these are good projects and uh, that is how the things work. But in ICU space, I think only in the last six, seven months or one year, people have realized quite a lot of how to, how this space, space works out. Um, and I don't see a lot of scammy projects gaining uh, mass uh, news uh, these days. But again, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. And that's one thing that, that I think is good is, um, I mean, it's always going to be newcomers to the space that are going to get scammed. Unfortunately, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you send me 10 ether, I'll send you 10 <laughs> ether back. <laughs> yeah. A lot of fake Twitter accounts out there. Um, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's really, really unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I think people are starting to wise up a little bit. At least the people who have kind of hopped in and are kind of kind of, kind of start to tell like what's what's worth it. And I, I hope that uh, and we have lost some of their money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And there, we're having projects that are uh, uh, starting to be like due diligence, right? And like let people know and and really spread the word. Which I really I'm a fan of those projects as well. Um, but the other thing you mentioned, you know, everything moving faster. I mean, this is. Uh, a bigger topic, right? Like the world is moving faster. Technology is moving faster. And part of that, part of what makes, you know, everything move faster is capital. Mm -hmm. And we are living, you know, blockchain. There's a lot of money Mm -hmm. uh, flowing around. And that's one of the factors that everything moves faster. Um, And yeah, I, I think we'll continue to see that trend grow. You know, the total market cap cryptocurrencies, right, is, is changed a lot in uh, the past, you know, six months. So we saw a huge spike, and now it's kind of dropped down, and is moving around and trying to find, trying to find its footing, right? Uh, trying mm-hmm. to find an equilibrium and, and, a, and a, maybe a, a steady trend of some kind, whether it's up or down. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think as that market cap like continues to. S- to grow, it's just it's going to have be more money flowing in the space, more money trying to build projects, and that it's just going to accelerate faster and faster. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I wanted to talk about, uh, I had interviewed a uh, consensus project called Balance, and I think it was relevant for the ICO space. Um, and sure. uh, what they were doing is like, say, they had built an accounting software for um people who are doing ICOs and token sales. Um, and basically, they, that they uh, set up the their lot of nodes uh, on, say, the smart contract, ICO smart contract. And uh, they had built a lot of tool sets. Like, say, if a company raised $20 million and um, they have, they had, they divide, like, say, 10 million has to go for the product, 5 million for legal, 5 million for uh, marketing or something like that. Then um, they ha- their 
software tracks that and it shows all the uh, like a traditional company when they they have to do their accounting so they sure. they are trying to fix that problem like and i think token sales might get transparent as well because um, no one knows how exactly the company are spending the money right now the, they are they have that they have raised is it only like the founders they are using it uh, to buy houses or on them um, <laughs> but if 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 we can track all the movement of where the money is going on which address and finally from where did it come out to the fiat world um i think that that would um make the whole ecosystem more transparent as well yeah 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 totally Mm-hmm. Um, so I, for the final topic, I wanted to talk about to, to you about the whole uh, DAB ecosystem in general. Like, uh, mm-hmm. where do you see that? Do you so do you see that? Um, uh, so I have two questions here. Like, one is that do you see that we'll we'll have DAPs replacing centralized applications, or we'll see DAPs enabling? Uh, new applications that weren't possible or we'll see a hybrid that there might be some part that they're replacing or uh, there are some new applications that weren't possible before. Sure. I think yes to all three. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I think where blockchain offers a 100% competitive edge to a centralized solution, I think eventually we will see that win in the long run. Uh, now, whether the centralized model will go away completely, that's different. That's a different question, right? Like, um, will it put some people out of business? I think so. Uh, will it cause them to be dwarfed by the centralized competition? I think that's going to be more the case. Uh, because, I mean, think about how slowly the entire globe is going to adopt this, right? Like, you're going to have, um, you know, you're going to have, you're always going to have people who are on the cutting edge, right? And then that, that, that percentage is going to grow and grow and grow as more mass adoption, you know, kind of happens. Right. Um, and in some cases, yeah, the, the, the centralized competition is going to die or it's going to become smaller uh, where it makes sense. Uh, I think there will be some places where we will see a hybridized model, right. Where I think some of the big companies will uh, feel the pressure to uh, kind of conform to the movement, right. They're going to have to, they're going to still going to maintain centralized infrastructure in some capacity in probably most capacity, but the uh, points of their business where they're either going to fall behind uh, the competition or lose the competition where they need to implement blockchain as, as a part of their solution, they're they'll, they'll do it. Um, and I guess what's the last one um, kind of new use cases, right? Like for mm-hmm. that, that aren't necessarily competing, but are, are providing uh, it's just a new paradigm, right? Like here's a new kind of application that is not just porting something over to blockchain or building a competitor. It's building something completely new. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it's going to be solving similar kinds of problems, right? But in a new paradigm, right? As we move into the blockchain space, as we move into Ethereum and, you know, if you believe in the token economy and you believe in all those kinds of things and how like crypto economic models work, um, yeah, there is a paradigm shift, a new way of thinking, a new way of uh, uh, new use cases that are going to come up, right? Like use cases for what I can do with Ether and how I can move that around. Like, sure, in a, in a sense, that's competition for our new way to solve like a money problem. But I think about that completely as like this own ecosystem over here and how what I can do with tokens and how I can do like, you know, tokenized voting and things like that. And like anything where you're starting to talk about token economics like those are new use cases in my mind so mm-hmm. um yeah i think for me um i'm even think i think about these things like uh, is ethereum the killer like do we really sure. need the tokens uh the, so sure. many tokens can't we only yeah. use ethereum uh, i think that like say we peepit is a good example for that like it it doesn't right. just uses normal ethereum no other uh bullshit uh, <laughs> and <laughs> i i do think about these things because uh like say if you are a user you don't want to buy a lot of tokens you don't want to uh buy um a specific token to use the platform um or or or, or there might be a say some uh wallet providers that enable exchanging of the tokens like say if you want to use some service um you you just ha- only have ether and 
within the service uh, it will convert to the token i think uh, that also need, would need to be figured out like uh, how that would happen out um, sure yeah okay gregory uh, you want to say something uh, as the final words and where can the people find you Sure. Yeah. So, uh, thanks again for having me on and and uh, doing this today. I'm super excited to talk about Ethereum and and decentralized applications. So you can find my YouTube channel, DAP University. I uh, head over there and catch up uh, on what I'm doing with my tutorials and other kind of talks like this. We're talking to people who are building on top of Ethereum. Um, you can check out my website, which is dappuniversity.com. We can find some uh, free downloads and some uh, step-by-step written articles and things like that about how to build decentralized applications on Ethereum. And yeah, if you're watching and you are wanting to build an Ethereum project, um, yeah, let me know. You can contact me on my website as well. And uh, yeah, thanks again for having me on. What about yourself? Yeah, yeah, just... Uh i think i uh, you link down my channel as well you can follow my channel i i'm i'm going to more talk about the research aspect of things and what is like scalability governance and all these issues um um and all that stuff and uh, f- like if you want to see a list of dapps i recommend uh, dapp radar i think you recommended and uh, state of the dapps um, is another site that i use so uh, yeah and i think week in ethereum is another site that the audience can check out if you want to remain updated of what is happening in the ethereum ecosystem yeah right right oh and last thing too uh uh i don't think we mentioned a lot of the mobile browsers that are out there mobile browsers and wallets have kind of merged right um check them out like uh uh trust wallet um toshi cypher status uh good places to start Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, checking out app the DApps on Toshi um, and trying them out is uh, super interesting. They have around thirty, forty app DApps, um, and I think all of them are decent. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, yeah. Uh, great talking, Gregory. I learned a lot from you today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you too. Yeah, awesome. I really enjoyed this. Okay, okay, okay. All right, everybody. See ya. Bye, bye.